Welcome, and thank you for standing by. All participants are in a listen-only mode for the duration of today's call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I would like to turn the call over to your host, Deb Rivera. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us. Thank you for being with us today. We are very excited to be hosting this question and answer webinar today about the Census Bureau's data platform, data.census.gov. My name is Deb Rivera, and I will be moderating the event. And in today's session, our speaker, Tyson Weister, will be spending some time going over the most frequently asked questions on data.census.gov. And with the help of my colleagues joining me today, we will be monitoring the chat and pulling some of your most pressing questions, which I will then read out to Tyson. That will be towards the latter half of the webinar. Having said that, I'd like to remind you all to please be careful not to include sensitive or personal information in the chat or the questions that you submit because we are recording. Some of these questions will be read out loud and they will later uh, be shared publicly once we release the recording. Also note that the question and answer session today will focus mainly on the platform data.census.gov. We will not be able to go in depth to address questions on 2020 census products or data. So again, uh, today we will be taking questions chat only, not over the phone, and you will remain in listen only mode for the duration of the webinar. So let's go ahead and I'll take a moment to locate the chat feature in your WebEx screen. If you don't already have the chat panel open and active, you can do so by hovering your mouse on the WebEx event screen and selecting the speech bubble icon that is located on the bottom right corner of your screen and it is labeled chat. To submit your questions, please be sure to select all panelists from the drop-down menu and this will allow all of our participants to see your questions. Now we hope to address as many questions as we can in the allocated one hour but if we are unable to, we will also be providing contact information where you can submit your questions. And I'm sure that we have a lot of those coming through, so I'm going to now go ahead and hand things off to our presenter, Tyson Lester. Thank you, Tyson. Great. Thank you, Deb. And thank you all so much for tuning into the webinar on data.census.gov, questions and answers. My name is Tyson Weister, and we'll go ahead and start diving into the content what we have prepared for you all today are uh, the first half of the webinar devoted to answering questions that we've already received. So these are questions that you all either emailed in advance specifically for this webinar or just the commonly asked questions that we tend to receive in general. We'll touch on these topics from the standpoint of someone who may be using data.census.gov for the first time and have questions as well as users who are familiar with the site and have questions about how to use it. The questions that we have kind of fall into these four categories, finding data, upcoming releases, selecting geographies, and downloading or printing tables. And then the remaining half hour of the webinar, we will devote to answering the questions that you all ask in the chat. Starting with a basic question, what is the recommended browser? Uh, Data.census.gov does work best in Google Chrome. We do support other browsers as well, but you're going to get the best speed and performance when you use Google Chrome. If you'd like that full list of supported browsers, please visit the FAQ at the bottom of the slide. Another common question, how do I find data for multiple topics? So, if you wanted data for veterans and you wanted data on household income, you would, in many cases, want to run two separate searches for this. So as you can see on the screenshot here, if you select in the upper left the topic for veterans and then run the search, you will get data for all of the tables on veterans. So this just shows an example of getting data for the percent veteran, 6.9%. And if you wanted data for median income for the overall population, you would want to run a separate search for income and earnings, which takes you to the tables on income and earnings. Most of those are going to reflect 
income of the total population, and here you can see the median household income being 65000 If you want data cross-tabulated, so you want um, income of veterans, then you would actually want to select both of those topics in one search. So this shows you selecting veterans topic as well as the income and earnings topic. Running that search will give you median um, of the veteran population. You can see it's 44,000. So if you want data on several topics but you don't want it cross-tabulated, run those searches separately. If you want data cross-tabulated, select those relevant topic tags in one search. Another common question, what data are available? On a high level, we have data from the American Community Survey from 2010 to the most recent 2019 ACS release, data from the decennial census from 2000 as well as 2010, and data from the economic census and selected surveys from 2012 to the present. So that's kind of the high level look. If you'd like to know detailed data sets, types of tables in the vintages that are available um, in a more granular specific level. That information is all available to you at the click of a button using the link on the left-hand side of this slide, which takes you to our FAQ. We also get this question phrased a little bit differently, wanting to know about other popular data sets that we don't currently have on data.census.gov and how to access them. Here we've laid out some of those for you and put together a collection of links that are targeted toward these specific types of data, whether you want data from population estimates, um, historical data from the decennial census, American Community Survey, and economic census, as well as special tabulations like the Equal Opportunity Employment Tabulation. These data, while they're not generally available on data.census.gov, you can get them from web pages, FTP, or file transfer protocol sites, and the Application Programming Interface, or API. Moving on to more focused data questions, one of the common ones we get is how can I get population density? We were not able, for technical reasons, to migrate those tables that had population density over to data.census.gov, but you can calculate that through other means of information. It's a matter of taking total population and dividing it by the land area. We have a variety of tables on total population on data.census.gov. I put those table IDs here for you on screen, whether you want it from Decennial, American Community Survey. We do have one population estimates program table on our site. Um, so that table is listed here, but most of that POP estimates data are available through their program webpage if you need more specific information. So find total population on data.census.gov. And then the land area is through another resource called the Gazetteer file. You'll visit the web page with the link on the screen, download the file for your geography type, and then most people would want to look at the column that says a land underscore SQMI for square miles. Another common question, how do I access data by race? As you work through the advanced search panel, no matter what topic you're selecting, um, you're always looking for checkboxes as a final selection. And any words and phrases without checkboxes that you click on uh, means that it's going to give you more detailed options on your right-hand side to choose from. When you navigate for race data in particular, you'll want to look at topics, race and ethnicity, and then decide the level of detail you want to go into. At some point in the process, you'll start to notice a lot of checkboxes. So just wanting to point out on a high level, there are words and phrases that do not have any codes next to them. Those filters will give you data from what we call kind of our standard tables. You want to use these to get totals for most race groups and then for characteristics of the major race groups like health insurance, or income of Asians, for example. The reason that you generally would like to give these options without codes a first try is that they're released more timely and they're available on a more general basis. The 
other checkboxes that do have codes with them. They give you data from another set of tables. We call these our iterated tables. It just means that the table is repeated for different race groups. It's helpful to use these tables if you want characteristics of detailed population groups. Maybe you want income or health insurance of the Japanese population. That would be a good use case for these iterated tables. So on the high level, just kind of noting that you'll get two different sets of results depending if you choose an option with codes or without codes. The other reason why we kind of say to use the standard tables first is that the iterated tables have specific population thresholds. Um, they vary by product, but they're more stringent than the generic population thresholds. For instance, American Community Survey estimates, the five-year are generally available for all geographies down to the block group level, regardless of population size in one year, generally available for areas of 65,000 people or more. This iterated tables have more strict population thresholds. They're detailed out in some of these links for you that I've put together. You can also access technical documentation for any type of table you're looking at on our site. We make it very easy by including a notes button at the top of the table, and when you click that button, you'll see key information that the data providers have put together for you, oftentimes including several links to their technical documentation that we're showing on screen here, just as an example for the technical documentation for the iterated table from Summary File 2 from the decennial census. But this um, notes are not unique to just race and ethnicity and iterated tables. They apply to any table you're looking at on data.census.gov. Moving on to another topic, upcoming data releases. We know that you all have lots of questions about the 2020 census. One of the questions that we received in advance of this webinar is when is the first 2020 census data release on data.census.gov happening? and what does it include? The first 2020 census data that's going to be released on our site is the redistricting data, PL94-171, which refers to the public law that these data are created for. The data will be released on data.census.gov by the end of September. Prior to that, we'll be, we'll be releasing the data through the legacy summary file format. So the same data, but it will be released August by August 16th, 2021. Um, so the data.census.gov release just follows that up and makes it easier to access. We've been releasing this information through the summary file format. It generally involves a little bit more work to get what you're needing and looking for rather than clicking very intuitive and easy to use menus that you can do on data.census.gov. So that's the when part. What does it include? Um, you know, it has a lot of unique data that's going to be released for the first time, but generally in the scheme of things, it's a smaller data release than the fact that it only has six tables. These tables will cover basic data on race, Hispanic origin, group quarters population, and housing occupancy status. It includes selected geographic areas down to the block level. If you'd like more information about what is coming with this release, I've included the link at the bottom of this slide that has the technical documentation for this particular data set. And if you want to prepare yourself on how to access this for September, I've included the survey filter here on the left-hand side of your screen showing how you would go about accessing these data, clicking the survey filter on the left, choosing decennial census, and then selecting redistricting data PL94-171. So that's really the extent of what we can speak to in regards to the 2020 census that we are looking forward to that release by the end of September. And this is how you would go about accessing the data. There are more 2020 census products coming later, but the timeline for that is still to be determined. That takes us to our next question about the 2020 census, how can I learn more about it? We've included the link here to the 2020 census website. So when you visit this link, 
you'll see key timelines that are included as well as other types of information that you may be interested in about the 2020 census. We definitely recommend taking a look at that link today and then also visiting it regularly as additional information is announced regarding the 2020 census. If you have any other follow-up questions, if they are about the data products or types of tables from the 2020 census, you can email the first email address shown in the upper right of the slide. Any other 2020 census topics, please submit your questions to our public information office at PIO at census.gov. Moving on to other topics, um, ge geography and selecting your geography is one of the most important but also sometimes challenging parts of your search on data.census.gov. So we do get a lot of questions related to how do I select my geography. On a basic level, one of the common ones we get is how do I select my city or town. At the Census Bureau, we generally call cities and towns as a place level geography. So for most states, you're gonna to wanna to go to the advanced search filter, click geography and choose place, and then follow the prompt. This just shows on screen an example of getting to the checkbox to select Atlanta City, Georgia. Some states, primarily in the Northeast and the Midwest, have towns, townships, and boroughs that you kind of may think as your city or town. They're legally called county subdivisions in those areas, so you will find them under geography and county subdivisions. Follow the prompt, and this just shows an example of selecting Stratford Town within Stratford County, New Hampshire. So if you're having a hard time finding your city or town, generally place is a good starting point for some states, you may want to consider the county subdivision level. And if you've gone through those steps, and sometimes you'll see a similar label in both of those areas, you may not be sure which one to check. The great thing about data.census.gov is you can select one geography, and then at the top of your screen, you'll see a Maps button. So anytime you select just one geography, and then you click the Maps button, it will take you to the selection map so you can visually look at the area that you just read the label of and maybe aren't sure what it means and visually see it on the map. So on the left-hand side, there's a selection for Bethel CDP, since it's designated place in Vermont, and then it shows the map because I've clicked on the map. There's also a label for Bethel Town, Windsor County, Vermont, under County Subdivision. If I wasn't sure what that label means, I select the geography, I click on map, and you can see the side-by-side -side comparison of these two areas. Uh, they definitely refer to different boundaries and different size geographies. So if you weren't sure reading the label which one to choose, the map should be able to help you make that final determination. Another common question, how do I access data for collections of zip code tabulation areas in bulk. Most people pretty intuitively can click through the panels and they'll see the option for all zip codes in the United States and all zip codes within a particular state. So those easy to use checkboxes are compatible currently with the 2019 American Community Survey. For the decennial census, you'll want to take a slightly different path right now where you'll click Geography, turn on the Show Summary Levels toggle, and then look for Summary Level 871. When you go through that pathway, you'll see checkboxes for things like all zip code tabulation areas fully or partially within a state. So that should meet a lot of needs if you want to access uh, the ACS data for collections of victims historically, so the 2018 all the way back to the 2011 ACS, we have an FAQ that touches on this in more detail since these checkboxes that I show aren't currently compatible with that historical ACS data. And then if you needed data from the decennial census for all victims in the U.S. rather than just all victims in a state, we also have an FAQ that goes into more detail on that. And sometimes users want to know what geographies are available for my data set. 
the nice thing about data.census.gov, um, it's helpful a lot of times to start with whatever you think is most important. Sometimes that might be your geography, but if you're ever not able to get to the end search results, uh, you can utilize these filters to your advantage to make sense of what's available on the site, especially there is so much available and it can seem overwhelming at times. So if you knew that you wanted data from the American Community Survey five-year detailed table, you could select that first as a survey, and then you can see the geographies that these data are tabulated for. All you would do is click Geography in the advanced search. You'll turn on the toggle that says Show Summary Level. Then you'll see that the geographic areas that are compatible with this, air, this uh, survey selection will be clickable, and all other areas which are not compatible will be grayed out. And what about other geography selections that I need? As an example, I had a data user who was looking for all of the census tracts in Palo Alto, California. A um, couple things with that. We do not have a single checkbox that you can select on the site to get all census tracts in a city. And then on top of that, census tracts don't necessarily neatly align with city boundaries. So some census tracts may be fully in the city, um, some census tracts will be completely outside of the city, and some may be partially within the city. The good news is there are a couple of resources here where you could get a list of all of the tracts that fall fully or partially within another geography. And you can do this not just at the track level, but different combinations of geographies that you maybe want to know are within a larger geography. Uh, one is the relationship file with the link at the very bottom of this slide, and the other is the Mabel GeoCore. So relationship files would be kind of the official way to get this information. Mabel GeoCore is a very easy to use tool. You just simply visit the website here that's shown on the slide. You'll select the state that you want, and then on the left, you'll choose the larger geography. So we wanted census tracts in Palo Alto City, so we chose place. And then we wanted to know what the census tracts were within that area. So we chose the smaller geography census tract in that second column. When you make those selections, you'll be able to click a button, and it'll generate a spreadsheet that has the list of information. And from there, you could individually select those census tracts on our site. And of course, always tell us what other geography options you want and need because we continue to update the site based on user feedback. The email address for that is sedsci.feedback at census.gov. Also, there may be times where you want to know the geographies for an address. We do not have an address search currently on the site, but you can use the census geocoder to find this information quickly. Simply visit the Census Geocoder, put in the address. Here I put in the address for the Census Bureau Regional Office in California, and you'll click Find. And then you just view the results. You go to the Census Tract section, and you look for the name. That's going to give you the very easy-to-read Census Tract 3105.01. And then you can go about selecting it on data.census.gov and get the data for it. Uh, that's kind of a high-level conceptual overview of what you would go about doing. Step-by-step -step instructions are included at the bottom of this slide in an FAQ. And for those wanting to create maps with data, one of the things that you may notice is that when you download data from data.census.gov, the GeoID can contains some extra characters compared to the Tiger Line shape files. So specifically, we're looking at GeoID for that census tract that the Los Angeles Regional Office falls within. At the beginning of data.census.gov, there are three digits that identify the summary level, 140, referring to census tract, two-digit two geographic variant, and two-digit geographic component, followed by U.S. So those are the extra characters that would be in the data.census.gov GOID. If you visit the link at the bottom of this slide, we have a formula that you can use in Excel 
and apply to all of the GeoIDs from your download in bulk. So with just a few easy clicks, you could delete all of those extra characters and have a nice one-to-one -one match between GeoIDs so you could go about mapping this data using ArcGIS or other software. And to close out, before we start opening up for your questions that you have today, I wanted to talk about downloading and printing tables. At the top of tables, when you click Customize Table and you're in the full table view, you'll see buttons that say Excel, Download, and Print. People are, you know, find those buttons relatively easy and intuitively kind of drawn into the download button. Please be aware that when you download data, it will give you machine-readable output. So it's a really great file format if you wanted to sort, map, or manipulate the information. If you want something that looks like the table, like you're seeing on screen, and is more human-readable, you actually would want the Excel file format option. So if the download isn't meeting your needs, click the Excel button at the top of the table and choose Export to Excel. And you'll notice, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, it's a very readable file format. Why are my customizations not reflected in my downloaded file? This is something that is currently built for export functionality, but um, is not currently available for download. So you're not missing anything if you're downloading files and seeing that maybe you turned off the margins of error, hit columns or rows from your table view, and you're still getting all of that data in your download. Uh, that functionality is not currently available on the site, but we would consider that feedback as a possible future enhancement and um, would also recommend seeing if the export may meet your needs. How can I download a PDF? You'll notice the PDF button is grayed out in every instance of the site. That's because we haven't yet done the technical back-end work to make this functionality work on the site, but what we have done is put a lot more work into the Excel file format. So we show here on screen, you click Excel and export to Excel. And notice on the right-hand side, there are two tabs, an information tab and a data tab. So the information tab contains all of the source information, your survey program, your table ID, your table title, the year of the data, it has the Census Bureau logo and even a web address that will take you back or anyone that you want to share this with to the exact same table view that you were looking at. And then on the second tab that says data, which we looked at in just an earlier slide as well, you can see it's, it's very easy to read and it's also optimized for printing. So your headers are going to carry over appropriately and it's really the best option if you want to print on the site as of now. Where can I learn more? Simply go to data.census.gov and click the Help button. That will take you to our data.census.gov resources page. Here you'll find all of our educational materials in a variety of formats. So we have video tutorials of different lengths and topics, uh, webinars that include general how to use the site, updates webinars, as well as focused topics such as mapping or how to access complex geographies. We have a release note, step-by-step -step PDF, and much more. Who can I contact to get help or provide feedback? In the upper right, there is a link that says feedback, and when you click it, you'll get our email address. So everything that we're doing on data.census.gov is driven by your feedback. If you have comments on how we can make the site work better for you, please let us know. We also take your data questions through this email address. So please just don't hesitate to reach out to us at any time. We're more than happy to help. And finally, another great way to stay in touch is by subscribing to our email updates. When you visit the link on the left, and click data.census.gov update. That will give you a free subscription to our updates, including our monthly newsletter. Through this newsletter, we let you know about the latest system enhancements, data releases, and educational materials for the site. 
And with that, I want to go ahead and turn it back over to my colleague, Deb. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Okay, so in just a few moments, we're going to begin our question and answer session. And if you haven't submitted your question yet, now would be the time to do it. Just make sure that you select the All Panelists in the drop-down menu option so all of our panelists can see your question and pull it. Um, but before we jump into the question and answer session, I'd like to say that we would greatly appreciate if you would take a moment to fill out and submit our webinar evaluation survey. You can tell us how we can improve our webinars and share topics that you'd like us to cover in future webinars. It takes approximately three minutes to complete, and you are, of course, more than welcome to bookmark the link and fill it out at your best convenience. Um, yeah, we always look forward to reading all of your comments and feedback, so we will be sending that link of the evaluation through the chat box, and it will also appear as a pop-up window as you are exiting the WebEx event. Um, if you have questions remaining after our session concludes today, please feel free to reach out to one of the two email inboxes here. If you are a member of the public, please reach out to the Center for Enterprise Dissemination. And for members of the media, you may contact the Public Information Office. Okay, there's the evaluation link. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the question and answer session. Tyson, our first question is, what data are available for the U.S. island territories, including health and disability type? Great, so thank you for the question. Um, off the top of my head, what I can say for that is the island areas, and I'm gonna go to the live site here just so you can see a little more clearly. Most of the country, so the 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, that type of information would be covered through the annual American Community Survey or Puerto Rico Community Survey, again, conducted every year. For the other island areas like Virgin Islands, Guam, and so on, when you go to the advanced search, data for those areas are still collected once every 10 years. They continue to get the short form census questions that count the population and collect basic demographics, as well as a sample of households that received the long form data um, to get at characteristics, so things like disability, health insurance, and more. When you go to surveys, if you're looking to get this information and click on decennial census of island areas, um, that's where you could pick one of these data sets. I, I'm not sure off the top of my head if all of the information related to island areas from 2000 and 2010 have been migrated, um, but what I would recommend is choosing one of these as a starting point. And then um, you can always select a topic as well. So under topics, health, you'll see disability or health. I would choose one to start um, and kind of drill into the tables there and see if that data has what it is that you're looking for. And if you have follow-up questions, we would recommend um, emailing us for more information. Thank you. And our next question is, so on slide 11, uh, do you have to select the year in years filter to get to the 2020 census after having selected the survey as decennial? Well, that's a great question. Um, you are more than welcome to select the year first. If you don't select a year, um, and I'll go ahead and actually show that particular data right now, surveys, again, the data for 2010 and, and 2000, but using that survey filter, so surveys, decennial census, and redistricting data. So that's gonna be the checkbox that you'll wanna select either way. You could go ahead and select a year first. If you don't select a year and you run the search and click on the table, what you're generally gonna notice is the most recent data will appear at the top of your results. So you'll notice at the beginning, there are a lot of tables for 2010. And then as you scroll down, you'll also see some data for census 2000. So you're more than welcome to select a year if you just wanna narrow to the 2020 census, but if you don't, you'll typically see those results at the top of your table relevancy. 
Thank you, Tyson. Our next question is, where can I find pre-1990 decennial census data? Yeah, thank you for the question. So when you, um, I'm gonna go ahead and navigate back to one of the slides so we can talk about this just a little bit more. The pre-2000 census data, so 1990 and earlier, are available through a couple of different resources. There is some information through this webpage. Again, these slides will be made available and you'll be able to click those links or you might be able to see it from my address bar as well while I'm on the page. Um, this will give you some of the information from every decennial census in PDF format. So it's really helpful for more common types of geographies or common types of data. If you're looking for the full set of data or more detailed geographies like census tracts or blocks, for instance, the FTP site would be a better way to dive into that information. And if you have follow-up questions, um, our focus and area of expertise is the data that is on data.census.gov. So those are two great starting points, but we'd also encourage you to reach out to library at census.gov with your specific data request. Thank you. So this next question, one of our participants wasn't able to join at the very beginning and they want some clarification on when the redistricting data will be released. They were under the impression that it was August 16th. Yes, I'm going to pull that slide back up. So those data will be released in legacy, so the summary file format, by August 16th. And then we'll follow up that release by releasing the same data, but we're going to put it on data.census.gov so it's easier for everyday folks to access that information, and that will happen by September 30th. Thank you for clarifying, Tyson. Our next question is, what is the best way to obtain data by geography for American Indian tribal areas if these exist? We definitely have a lot of information for American Indian Alaska Native, that could honestly be its own webinar. If you're looking for that information for American Indian areas, the starting point that I would recommend is go to the advanced search, and then on the left, click on geography. And then once you scroll down, you'll want to choose American Indian area, Alaska Native area, Hawaiian homeland. So from here, you could scroll through the list. Um, it gives you the first 100 areas by default, but if you wanted to go somewhere else, you could click the magnifying glass in the upper right and type in a keyword like Navajo as an example. And if you wanted data for people that live on the Navajo reservation, go ahead and mark the checkbox. You may select additional search criteria, and at some point you would run the search. Um, but to get to the geography, I would recommend geography, American Indian area, Alaska Native area, Hawaiian homeland, make a selection, and then start accessing the data. These data will be reflective of everyone that lives on the Navajo Nation reservation, regardless of their race and ethnicity. Um, but we also have tables that slice and dice the information um, based on race and ethnicity as well. So lots of ways that you could go about um, diving into this in more detail, but as a high-level starting point, I would definitely recommend that. And you can also verify your selected geography, as we mentioned in the webinar, by clicking on maps and seeing that it um, zoomed us into the selected area in the Navajo Nation Reservation actually crosses a few states. Okay, thank you, Tyson. Our next question is, what criteria is used to label a city a county subdivision versus a place? It's about the way that the areas are legally defined within each state. Beyond that, I would recommend reaching out to our geography experts. They would be able to answer the way that things are defined. Um, you can reach them at geo.geography at census.gov. The other thing that may be helpful 
to answer this question or any question really uh, related to definitions at the Census Bureau is to check out our glossary. So if you just Google Census Bureau glossary, um, the very first result will be the Census Glossary, and you can click on there. And a lot of times when I have uh, a definitional type question, I could go ahead and, and click through here to access that information and, for example, click on C and start looking for county, county division, see if this might have information. And uh, in this case, we can see it has a related term link for county subdivision, so you can kind of click through and um, start to get links and short definitions. So I would recommend those two. Great, thank you, Tyson. Our next question is, how do you find rural and urban areas? Yep. So on data.census.gov, I'm gonna go to the advanced search. Uh, we do have an FAQ that walks through this process as well but I'm gonna show you a little bit on the site, and if you have a more detailed follow-up question, I would recommend checking out the FAQ or emailing us. In general, um, urban, most people for urban and rural would want the urban-rural component. So those are, for instance, if you're looking at the national level, maybe you wanna know how many people across the nation live in an urban area versus a rural area or maybe you want to know within your particular state what the population look like in urban Tennessee versus rural Tennessee. Those two things refer to as geographic components. They're not unique to just urban rural, but they're one of the more popular ones. One way you can go about accessing geo components is click on geography. First you would start, do you want urban rural at what level geography? One of the popular ones is nation. Then you'll turn on the Show Geographic Components toggle. So we kind of hide these from the default view so that people don't accidentally click something that they're not interested in and get a very limited set of table results. So that's why it's a little bit of an extra step or two to make these appear on screen um, so that it doesn't lose people who wouldn't want these. For the United States, there are a lot of geographic components. They are alphabetized, so notice I'm going to United States I. Uh, I would be looking for United States R for rural or U for urban. So I scroll through, I see United States. Most folks would just want United States rural. If you want to slice and dice this geography even further, there are more options. Many of these are just compatible with decennial census data, but something like uh, general U.S. urban and U.S. rural would also be compatible with ACS data. So as a starting point, I would recommend selecting your primary geography here on the left, choose show geographic components, look for a nice clean label. You probably want U.S. rural and U.S. urban and then maybe you add additional search criteria. At some point, you run a search, and then you start to look at the table results. In this case, we can see the first table from the 2019 ACS one year shows approximately 264 million people in the U.S. live in urban United States, and when we scroll on the right, about 63 million people in the U.S. live in rural United States. That would be a great starting point, and if you have more detailed questions about urban rural, um, it's definitely a complex geography, so feel free to reach out to us by email. Thank you, that was very helpful, uh, Titan. Okay, our next question is, will the five-year ACS data be released for all Census 2020 block groups this December? For confirmation on that, um, I would ask that you Send that question to ACSO for American Community Survey Office, acso.users, plural, users, plural, um, dot support, acso.users, dot support at census.gov. In advance of the release, they will have that information documented and they may be able to give a more definitive answer to your question in, even in advance of that. 
Great. Thank you, Tyson. Our next question is, how can we get sets of data within a geography? For example, population numbers for every block within a city. So there's a few different ways we can go about that. And just to see it a little more clearly, I'm going to pull up here on the website. So on the advanced search, one thing that you would be looking for are what we call the checkboxes at the top that allow you to select collections of geographies. Sometimes we call them pseudo geographies. If you're looking at the block level, I don't believe on the site that we currently have a single checkbox with that exact combination, all blocks in a city. We do have a lot of other options to select collections of geographies in bulk. So if you wanted all blocks in a state, all blocks in a county, or all, oh, not, you'd have to select them individually. So all blocks in a state or all blocks in a county are what we have currently built. We are continuously adding more of these checkboxes, and sometimes you can also find more checkboxes by um, going to different summary levels. So when you turn on the Show Summary Level toggle, you may see multiple options here that say Block Group or Block, and you may want to click on a few of those just to see if they have something for all blocks in a city. If there isn't one, here on the site, again, you're more than welcome to email us so we can double check what's available in your specific use case. The other option to get this information would be either the Maple GeoCore or those relationship files. And I'm navigating back here on the slides just to pull it up on screen one more time for you. That was this slide where we had talked about this website. In your case, it sounds like you would want to first select a state, then choose place and then choose census block. And when you run that search, it would give you the list of all census blocks um, in, a, in a particular cities within states. In addition to that, again, the geography relationship file would be another way that you could go about getting that information. Not gonna go through the steps here, but I would recommend checking that out. And if you have questions about this resource, you can also email geo.geography at census.gov. Thank you, Tyson. Our next question is, how do we stay informed about changes that are made to tables in the ACS? Yes, yeah, thank you for the question. When you go to census.gov, I would recommend going directly to the American Community Survey website, so census.gov slash ACS. And under technical documentation on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm going to click that. And then you want to look for the table and geography changes. So once you click table and geography changes, it will ask you kind of what vintage you're looking at and do you want the one or the five-year estimate. So I'm going to click as an example table changes under the tab for 2019 and 2019 ACS one year. And this is going to give you the table changes between 2019 ACS one year and 2018 ACS one year. So change over that one year period of time between releasing those tables, it will tell you about new tables, modified tables, so changes, and then if there were any deleted tables, it would appear here as well. So this is a really great page where you can visit. If there's a particular table ID you're searching for, I recommend pressing Control F on the page and searching for your table ID to see if there's any information about what it is that you had in mind you were looking for, as well as just browsing it in general. Thank you very much, Tyson. That was super helpful. So our next question is, what additional handling and software will be required to extract tables for data released August 16th? Any question about the summary file and the technical expertise that's needed for that, um, I'm unable to answer. Our area of expertise is data.census.gov, but on the slide here, the link at the very bottom is the link to the redistricting office technical documentation for this release in particular. 
So once you click on this and go to the technical documentation, you can see the first link here is the Census State Redistricting Technical Documentation. That will have all of your questions answered. It's very detailed, 247 pages, um, but you pro should probably get a sense within the first couple of pages as to, um, from a technical standpoint, what would be involved, at least on a high level. Okay, thank you. And our next question is, where can I find Zikta data for 2018 and earlier? So that was, um, I'm actually going to click back on the slides here, and we had shown you just how easy it is to select collections of big code tabulation areas in bulk, but that is compatible with 2019. When you visit the FAQ on this slide, or ask.census.gov, the short answer is that it will take you to instructions that tell you how to get it through the application programming interface or API. I'd recommend checking this out. Um, it also gives step-by-step -step walkthroughs on how to use the API and how to get um, the list of victims in your state if you need that. So definitely check this out. And if you have questions about using the application program interface or API, our area also handles that. So you can email the same email address that we're showing on the screen today. Okay, thank you, Tyson. So one more question here. We need to get socioeconomic and housing data within 0 0.5 and one mile radius of a point for a grant application. How can we download data to use in GIS to get that data? So currently we do not have an option on our maps on data.census.gov that allow you to select geographies within a certain radius of a point. What I would recommend is maybe consulting to see if there's any other resource that would give you at least a list of the census tracts or census block groups. Um, those would be areas that you could get socioeconomic information from the Census Bureau for and at least maybe find out which ones touch that radius area and find the census data we have for that. Uh, we don't have a functionality on our site currently to select the geography in the way that you're describing. Other tools that maybe um, allow that functionality would give you some sort of approximation as an end result. Um, so we don't have the, the socioeconomic data exactly for that point. So they would either give you the information for all the tracks and block groups that touch that radius, even though it doesn't equal exactly the boundary of the radius that you want and need, or sometimes they maybe would make some assumptions. So if a Census tract is halfway in that radius and halfway outside of the radius. They may divide the numbers in half and kind of spit out information to you um, in, in that way. So those would be two approaches that you could consider. And then the matter of finding the um, census block groups or census tracts that fall in that radius would involve you consulting with other external resources. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Tyson. And that is the end of our question. So I'd like to thank everybody who submitted a question and also for the great feedback that we're receiving via the chat. So thank you very much for your participation. And now I'm going to turn it back to Tyson and we can go ahead and wrap up the webinar for today. Great. Thank you, Deb. I just wanted to close out with one additional resource that is available and it's through our data dissemination and training branch at census.gov slash academy. That is the educational hub for the U.S. Census Bureau. They have webinars, short videos or data gems, and other resources on a variety of topics and tools across the Census Bureau, not just specifically ones related to data.census.gov. So definitely recommend checking out for those reasons. In addition, at the bottom of this slide, 
is a link to request a free training from your local data dissemination specialist. So there is a specialist assigned to your state, and if you'd like a local training, simply email us at census.askdata at census.gov or 1-844-ASK-DATA. Thank you again all so much for tuning in and for your great questions, and we look forward to staying in touch with you on a future webinar. Thank you for your participation. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Thank you. Speaker, stand by.